Okay, welcome back. Round two, my second ever video. So uh, I want to start off by saying thank you so much for watching the first video. I am shocked and thrilled that so many of you checked it out. I did not expect it to do much of anything. I kind of thought maybe I'd get three or four people actually watch it. Um, maybe twice that many check it out and click off of it. And uh, it actually had um, over 60 unique people watching it. And of course, not everybody watched it all the way through, but I know from the comments that some of you made and and uh, just from looking at the analytics that many of you did, and that's sh shocking to me. <laughs> I know 61 views isn't a uh, insane number, but when you think about the fact that it's Bible study on Numbers 1, chapter or verses 1 through 19, that is kind of an insanely good amount of views. So I uh, just want to say thanks again for all those that checked it out, took the time, um, and uh, left comment. I, I, I appreciate all that more than you can know, and uh, it's really encouraging to me. I've often talked with family and friends about the idea of, you know, it, it seems like in our churches many times uh, we are only talking about relatively simple biblical topics, and I somewhat understand that the Sunday morning church services are really geared towards new people, uh, trying to make it fairly friendly for new members of the church or people just visiting, and then most of our churches have canceled all services except for Sunday morning, so <laughs> it kind of limits the amount of time to get kind of nitty-gritty into the Word. Um, so I, I've talked with uh, friends and, and family members who've been interested in doing deeper level stuff, and, and some people say, yeah, I really think there's an appetite out there for it, and some people are like, no, I don't, I don't really think that exists. And to me, this was just a sign that, yeah, there is an, an actual appetite for going a bit deeper into the Word of God, and, and I think that's fantastic. It's kind of funny, after the last video, people shared with me several podcasts and, and other videos that might be interested in that were talking about similar topics. And I greatly enjoyed that. I appreciate it. I, I listened to all those, and they was, were great. But it kind of made me think one of the things that somebody shared with me was a podcast where people talked about the Book of Numbers. They were trying to teach through it, and, and they did. Um, but they covered, like, two books in numbers and they did a lot of prep work kind of talking about what was going on there and they really didn't do much verse by verse commentary or really get into the nitty gritty and uh, what I thought was kind of amusing was that at the end they started talking about Jesus and I think the, re the redemption of mankind and um, and that's great absolutely biblical it's a fantastic thing it's not really what numbers chapter 1 and chapter 2 are about I think it's funny that people are so set on the things they feel like they're supposed to talk about, the things they're supposed to feel like they're supposed to teach, that sometimes it's like all roads lead to going back and talking about Jesus. And that's fine. I know some people want to make sure every time they teach that they, they get the gospel in there, and that's fine. That's fine. But, you know, you don't actually have to do that. Like, you can. And I'm not saying it's wrong if you want to, but there, Numbers 1 and Numbers 2... It's about counting and where, where you camp. Those are the main things. And it's okay to teach on Numbers 1 and teach what it says and just let it be a lesson about what the Bible says, that they did a census. It's okay to let a census just be a census um, and not feel like you need to spiritualize it and, and come up with some greater meaning. Like, if that, if that comes to you, and if fine. I'm not saying it's wrong. Absolutely not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying... It sometimes feels like we're trying to force what we feel we need to teach into the Bible rather than letting the Bible just say what it says. I was talking to my dad about uh, teaching stuff as well, and uh, you know, I mentioned something that I was thinking about doing numbers before I uploaded my first video, and he and I was like, yeah, I don't know that it's really uh, gripping or, or kind of preaches well, and uh, I, I don't know if you can like yank something out of it and make it real practical, down to life uh, sort of stuff practical and applicable to daily life sort of thing. And he's like, is that what is that what the Bible's for, for you to grab something out of it and make it applicable to daily life? And it's kind of a, a worthwhile question is, does every th single thing have to be for that purpose? Uh, another thing that comes to mind is uh, my favorite Bible teacher, somebody who, who did a lot to help get me back into the Word. He's He does YouTube videos. His name is Mike Winger. Um, he's not somebody I know locally. He's just got a big YouTube page for, you know, people who teach the Bible anyway, big by that standard. And uh, Mike Winger, a really good guy, I fully, fully uh, suggest you check him out. He did a sermon on some section of the Bible, I don't remember what it was, but 
he said that, you know, some people like to say that, that this section is boring. And to that, I, I say, yeah, maybe uh, not everything written in the Bible is necessarily for our entertainment. You know, some things can be edifying. They can help educate us. They can give us useful information without necessarily being gripping and exciting. Uh, so anyway, I, th I think those are all interesting perspectives to, to think about, you know, Sometimes you can just let the Bible be the Bible. I, again, though, appreciate everybody who sent those to me. Everything that was sent to me was was very nice and helpful and useful. And uh, I, I love listening to those sorts of things as I'm working around the house, uh, sometimes at work. And um, so anybody wants to send that to me, by all means, if you find something you think could be useful to me, please send it to me. So we're going to go on with the Book of Numbers. I was actually thinking about doing some other stuff, but uh, I, I was always planning on continuing with the Book of Numbers, but I was actually thinking about doing something else for my next video, and then when I saw I actually got a little bit of traction on this one, I thought, well, before I do something a little different, maybe I should do a few more Numbers videos. First lesson we did was on uh, verses 1 through 19, and the basics of that is just God told Moses and Aaron to do a census for the purpose of war. Uh, this is about... 13 months after leaving Egypt, they're still at Mount Sinai. I kept saying Sinai in my last video like it's Sinai, and it drove me crazy when I was editing it. Sinai. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a few things more frustrating than realizing you said something wrong and not being able to fix it without recording a whole new video. It's, it's really... Anyway, they're still at Sinai. God told them to do this war census, and he picked out several men, uh, you maybe called the Chosen, but several men to represent each tribe to have leadership positions in the tribes to help with the census. And there'd be ongoing leadership positions. And we talked just about lots of little details in that and just trying to figure out what it was saying in as much detail as possible. And that's where we're picking up this time. There were a couple of things I wanted to mention as kind of a follow-up to that last video. Uh, you remember we talked about Abayath? Uh, Abayath last time. That was one of the th ways that God wanted people counted was by their Abayath. Um, and this translates directly to father's houses, but specifically that word Bayath means sort of a household, a patriarchal household that uh, existed as long as the oldest living patriarch lived. Um, everybody, all the sons underneath him would be part of the same Bayath. There was some ambiguity in that term because it used Abayath, father's houses. And Abayath isn't a term we see in the Bible very often, so it's not clear what it was. I speculated based on some verses that in, in Numbers chapter 3 that it might be talking about the grandsons of Israel and the tribes that would descend out of those. Uh, I was listening to a series of lectures called Morality, Law, and Justice in the Bible. I don't recommend it. It's not very good. Uh, at least, uh, I wouldn't recommend it specifically because the, the guy teaching it seems to be a liberal Christian. And by liberal Christian, I don't mean a Christian that votes for Democrats. I mean a Christian who believes that the Bible is not the inspired word of God. It's simply people's best attempt to understand God and to guess at what he thinks about the world. Um, so they believe in progressive revelation or inspiration. They would say it's inspired in the sense that anything truly beautiful or wonderful or wise is inspired, not inspired in the sense that God wrote this through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, uh, because of that, unsurprisingly, it comes to a lot of wrong conclusions. I generally find his applications of principles to be pretty horrible. Regardless, the factual information, the factual information in that seemed to be pretty good from what I could tell. It was from a college professor who's, you know, quite experienced in this field. Um, I don't like his application, but his actual information seemed to be pretty good. He said that back in the day, you would always identify yourself uh, in this culture by your name, and then your family group, the, the Bayeth, uh, you'd always identify yourself by your Bayeth, your name, your Bayeth, and then your clan, which is like a larger group of associated families or Bayeths, and finally by your tribe. Okay, so it'd be name, Bayeth, your, your household, your larger clan group, and then your big tribal group. Uh, so with that in mind, if that is the typical way of identifying yourself in ancient Israeli culture, then this would simply seem to be, this would fit in really neatly with Bayeth simply, me, Abayeth simply meaning Bayeth, the, the household, patriarchal household. So most likely that would be it. It just makes perfect sense since all the other aspects seem to be in place in that scripture. So basically God's just saying, I want to know you very specifically who you are exactly. 
where you come from, that sort of thing. Basically just asking for their name in, in a detailed form. Uh, another thing that we talked about last time, but since that time I've come to some more information. Uh, specifically, we talked about how Joseph, we spent a lot of time talking about how Reuben was the firstborn of Israel, yet he didn't get the double blessing. Joseph got that. And I said it's really weird because even though most of these events are recorded in Genesis, the fact that Reuben lost his status as the as the firstborn in terms of getting the double portion wasn't covered in Genesis. You had to go all the way to First Chronicles for that. And that's not true. <laughs> it actually was there and I just missed it. So let's talk about that real quick. In Genesis 49.3, and this is the section where uh, Jacob is giving all, Jacob, Israel, is giving all his blessings to his sons. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power. And stable as water, you shall not have preeminence. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. So, not, not super happy fun time. Uh, not what you want to hear from your dad. So, I guess it doesn't specifically say he loses his status as the firstborn, but considering that it's then given to Joseph, it seems a lot more clear. Uh, it, it pretty much is spelled out there. Uh, it's still need First Chronicles to technically say that it was taken from one and give to another, but it's more or less there. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Want to correct myself a little bit there. Moral of the story is, don't sleep with your father's concubine. The more you know, right? Also, there seems to be a deeper meaning to this. Uh, something I came across, I'll link it in the description of the video. I try to share as much of the things I was looking at that are, are online resources. I try to share them in, in the description of the video in case you want to check it out for yourself. Anyway, somebody said, and I looked up these scriptures and it seems to be accurate, that in those days it was customary for new kings to assume the harem of their predecessors. So in other words... If you're a great man, um, I, I guess specifically a king, one of the ways you would try to establish your dominance is by sleeping with, with those other people, uh, your king's predecessor's harem. And uh, see several verses linked there, look those up, and yes, indeed, that seems to be during the kingdom time of Israel the way things were going. Um, so assuming this was a cultural thing uh, in the time of Israel, Israel as well, then Israel, though not exactly a king, was certainly a great leader, a, a rich man, uh, maybe more or less the equivalent of a king. And here his, his eldest son tried to sleep with his concubine. It might be a little bit like, hey, die off, dad. I'm, I'm ready to take your place. Kind of like that whole prodigal son sort of thing where he says, hey, give me my inheritance, even though you're not dead yet. Um, it's a bit of a slap in the face. Not to mention just icky. I also wanted to mention that nobody's answered my questions from last time. Uh, remember, I, I ended with a couple of questions. One relating to the order that the chosen from to be the leaders of the different tribes of Israel were listed. Remember, they were all in a, a neat little order according to the birth order of Leah's sons and the birth order of Rachel's sons um, in order of preeminence and then birth. And uh, then when, when it got to the handmaid's children, they were just all out of order. So why? That was weird. And the other thing is, what is the number of names? Most people seem to be suggesting that refers to genealogies, but I couldn't find that really nailed down to my satisfaction. Um, and uh, also, uh, just some information on biblical genealogies in general. Uh, that comes up again in today's lesson, and uh, people have told me forever that they have these great genealogies. Well, let me do some resources so I can look into that. Uh, it seems to be a common understanding among Christian communities, so why do we have that understanding? Does, does anybody have a good reason for that? That they had these big complex genealogies? Because it seems like it would be really hard to do back in the day when, you know, you didn't have the printing press. Or presumably common ability to write, though, you know, it's a little hard to prove that sort of thing. So anyway, if anybody has any ideas about the number of names or the order that the chosen were listed, I'd be interested in hearing it. Uh, in this section, I, there are actually a couple of really hard issues which I've been diving into pretty deeply, and it's eating up a bunch of time. I'm actually getting close to being ready to teach on those, but just going to get together quick enough, and I want to give you something rather than nothing. So this is probably going to pair really, really, really well with the next video that comes out. Uh, also, the things we're talking about in here, uh, I, I have some things to point out, but it's going to be mostly me pointing out and going, eh. That's strange, and I don't really have any. Uh, I've tried, but I haven't come up with any significance to them. So there is some stuff that I do have significance, but a lot of it's just kind of like, oh, here's a little odd thing. Um, I just don't have much to say about it. So the actual teaching will probably be pretty short. 
is we're going to talk about the order in which things are listed here. There's another list, another uh, pattern to the way things are listed. We're just going to look at the details. There's some slight variability in what we're seeing here in this uh, census, and we're going to point out some kind of interesting things there. And finally, we're going to spend some time talking about Judah. It's just something I, I came across as I was looking into this, and I found it to be pretty interesting. So we're going to talk a little bit about the role of Judah in Israel. So that's it. We're going to get into it. I'm going to go ahead and read the scriptures, even though this is a pretty good chunk of, of verses that say almost the same thing every time. It's just the census. I thought about skipping it. Uh, I just feel bad teaching the Bible and not actually reading the Bible. Uh, it doesn't seem, it's, it's bad juju to use a, a scriptural term. It's not a scriptural term. Um, yeah, it just, it just feels kind of weird. So I'm going to read it. It's pretty repetitive. So if you want to set, you know, the video to two times or skip ahead about three minutes, probably how long it took me to read it. So again, this is right after the Bible stated that Moses and Aaron began immediately, presumably along with the Chosen and a bunch of other people, to go about the task of numbering all the children of Israel, and we're just going to pick up right after that. The people of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who are able to go to war. Those listed as the tribe of Reuben were 46,500. Of the people of Simeon, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, those of them who were listed, according to the number of names, head by head, every male from twenty years old and upward, all who were able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Simeon, were fifty-nine thousand three hundred. Of the people of Gad, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, all who were able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Gad, were forty-five thousand six hundred and fifty. Of the people of Judah, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war. Those listed of the tribe of Judah were seventy-four thousand six hundred. Of the people of Issachar, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war. Those listed of the tribe of Issachar were fifty-four thousand four hundred. Of the people of Zebulun, their generations by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Zebulun were fifty-seven thousand four hundred. Of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the people of Ephraim, their, gener their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Ephraim were forty thousand five hundred. Of the people of Manasseh, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Manasseh, were thirty-two thousand two hundred. Of the people of Benjamin, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Benjamin, were thirty-five thousand four hundred. Of the people of Dan, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Dan were sixty-two thousand seven hundred. Of the people of Asher, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war, those listed of the tribe of Asher were forty-one thousand five hundred. Of the people of Naphtali, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war. Those listed of the tribe of Naphtali were fifty-three thousand four hundred. These are those who were listed, who Moses and Aaron listed with the help of the chiefs of Israel, twelve men, each representing his father's house. So all those listed of the people of Israel, by their father's houses, from twenty years old and upward, every man able to go to war in Israel, all those listed were 603,550. All right, so I already mentioned there would be something about the order here. So you remember last time, again, it was an order of birth with a little bit of preeminence thrown in there when we were talking about the order of the chosen, talked about at the beginning of the book of Numbers. That list started with Reuben and then went to Simeon, if I'm recalling correctly. And this one, when we're listing the order of the tribes and, and tallying them up, also begins with Reuben, goes to Simeon. So we have the same order here, right? Wrong. There's actually a difference. So what order are they in? Well, they're in order of how they camp, which will be talked about in Numbers 2. In Numbers 2, it talks about uh, how they are to, how Israel is to have Levites at the center and 
I don't know, Levites at the center, and then on each side there's different groups of people. Three here, three here, three here, three here. So, that's the order that this is associated with. It's sticking with their order of encampment. That's the order of, uh, that's the grouping of camps. Um, Dan, Judah, Reuben, and Ephraim are all the leaders of those camps, and then they have two tribes with them each. And then Levites would be in the center, in case you're unfamiliar. Uh, they don't seem to follow any particular order in terms of which groups are named first. Reuben, Simeon, Gad, they're grouped together. Next comes Judah, Iskar, Zebulun. Next, Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. And finally, Dan, Asher, Naphtali. So the order, uh, it's definitely following the order of groups, but the grouping around the Levites seems to be a bit random. It goes south, east, west, north. Eh, I don't know why. That's, there's going to be a lot of that in this chapter. Just stuff that's like, well, that's there. Don't know why. Moving on, you see in verse 20, we see many of the things we discussed in the last chapter. It talks about by their clans, by their father's houses. Again, these are these details of, of how you would specifically identify a person. According to the number of names, most people seem to suggest that's some sort of genealogical thing. Head by head, every male from 20 years old and upward. We talked about all of this in the early, last video. All that's been covered, we're not going to talk about it again. Uh, all who are able to go to war. Not going to talk about it again. However, there is a new thing thrown in here. Their generations, and this is in every single one of these, not just verse 20. Uh, that word translated their generations is tolida, uh, means descent, family, history, birth, generation. So again, pretty straightforward translation. It seems to be just saying that as they were doing this, they were particularly getting their generations. I have no idea how much or how far. And again, I'm really confused to how they were keeping these detailed genealogies at the time or how they managed to get all this done um, if they were doing detailed genealogies at the same time. Maybe their genealogies is just the tribe, the clans, the, uh, the father's houses, and the, their name. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I got a lot to talk about, about just slight variations in these, in these verses. I know it seemed like I was reading the exact same thing over and over again if you were actually listening to the, the reading of the scriptures, but there's tiny little variations, and we're just going to note them. Uh, in verse 20, you'll see that Reuben's pointed out as Israel's firstborn. Why this was worth pointing out, I don't know, but it's there. Same thing with Joseph in verse 32. It says, uh, of the people of Joseph, he's one of the only people who, in terms of description, gets a little extra. Of the people of Joseph, namely of the people of Ephraim, their generations. I found that really interesting because usually Ephraim is just referred to as Ephraim. The, the tribe of Ephraim is just called the tribe of Ephraim. But here, for some reason, it says the people of Joseph, namely the people of Ephraim. Um, so it seems to be just suggesting that that authority or legacy goes through Ephraim, which I guess is kind of goes without saying. Um, but for some reason, somebody felt like pointing it out here. Again, I feel so kind of sorry for Manessa. He kind of gets the short stick. Going back to verse 20, um, there are a couple other variations here. This is sh uh, shared by verse both verse 20 um, in with Reuben and verse 22 with Simeon. Uh, these add a couple of things that are not in the other verses listed in this section. This one mentions head by head and every male. All right, so it points out that it needs to be individually, each individual person needs to be counted, and it needs to be just the males of fighting age. Now, these two phrases are in with Reuben and Simeon. They're not mentioned again. Why? I, I guess just natural variation of the author feeling like, eh, he said this twice, he doesn't need to repeat it. But of course... If that's your logic on why those excluded, you could be like, why didn't he just say, and Reuben, this many, and Simeon, this many. I mean, it's already implied, right? I don't know. Could have saved a lot of reading time. In uh, verse 22, when it mentions Simeon, it says, those of them who are listed, I guess I should read context, uh, it says, of the people of Simeon, their generations, by their clans, by their father's houses, those of them who were listed, according to the number of names. This is the only verse in this entire section that throws in that those of them who were listed at this point. I don't know why it's there. I can tell you that the word that's used there, this is the Strong's definition for them on the screen, those of them who were listed is Picard. Uh, and it's one of those, with, with the verbs, it seems like some of the base verbs can be used very flexibly with a lot of different meaning. So I went ahead and underlined some of the sections that 
some of the meanings that might be especially useful for its use here, muster, number, sum. So Picard is actually used many times in this chapter, and every time it's, tr it's translated with the idea of listing in there, at least in the ESV. Um, but it's just the section that uses it that's different. So there at the end, where, it, like for instance, in verse 25 says, those listed, that's Bacad, of the tribe of Gad were 45,650. Number In 27, those listed of the tribe of Judah were 74,600. That's Bacad. Um, but none of the other verses have it in this section where it goes, by their clans, by their father's houses, those of them who were listed, Bacad. None of the others have that except for, for Simeon. So, yeah, I don't know why that's in there, but it is. This verb might actually be important in some of the complicated things we're going to talk about next time. So, kind of worthwhile to go ahead and get that on the record now. So, from verses 26 to 42, the exact phrase, their generations, by their clans, by their fathers' houses, according to the number of names, from 20 years old and upward, every man able to go to war is used. The entire phrase is there completely consistently. So, there tend to be more variations in the earlier verses, and again, maybe it's just somebody's like, eh, I said some of this a bunch of times, I don't need to repeat it over and over again. And so they started using the same formalistic thing over and over again. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, next thing to notice is that in verse 25, it says, those listed of the tribe of Gad were 45,650. Now, this is actually important, or potentially important, again, based on some of the things we talk about next week. Uh, because this is the only count in this entire section that ends in a multiple of 50. Everything else is rounded off to the nearest 100, um, and none of them have any anything below that. Every single other tribe is rounded to 100, and Gad, for some reason, is rounded to a 50. Uh, it would be pretty weird for that to be random. You would think out of another 11 tribes getting a count, one of them, if you're just rounding to the nearest number, would be closer to 50 than 100, so kind of strange. Uh, can't make too much of it, but it's kind of strange. And none of them are counted down to the number, unless everybody just happened to be a multiple of 10, which the chances of that are are, are astronomically small. Um, so yeah, something kind of weird going on there. If you actually compare the count here, you'll notice that Ephraim, the one who was lifted to the position of prominence by Israel, uh, actually has more people than Manasseh, the one that was the firstborn, but that was bumped out of order of preeminence by, by Israel for some reason. So it's interesting that that prophecy seems to already be taking shape, uh, that, that Manasseh is leading Ephraim. The secondborn is, is gaining more than the other. Another thing that's interesting is in regards to Judah. Judah has already got more people than anybody else in it. He is the largest tribe. And Judah, as you probably know, has a position of, of preeminence amongst the tribes. So that just got me on a, a tangent about why is Judah in that position of authority. And it was pretty interesting. So we're going to talk about it, and then we'll be done. So Judah is not actually the first son of Israel. He's actually the fourth son of Israel. We already talked about how Reuben lost his birthright by having sex with his dad's concubine. Uh, Simeon is the second son, and we haven't talked about him. Now, Simeon is the one who is a very violent man. Uh, Jacob, Israel specifically says this when he's doing his blessing. He condemns him as an extremely violent man. If you'll remember, there was the, the raping of Dinah, one of uh, the, Israel's daughters. And Simeon was one of the ones who led the charge on killing an entire male populace of an entire town, to get retribution for the rape of his daughter. So, pretty drastic. Um, not great. So, Reuben has been tainted. Simeon has been tainted. Uh, next up, we have Levi was the third son, and he was chosen, perhaps not coincidentally, uh, as the one to be the priestly tribe, to have a special place among the, the different tribes. So, you could say he, Judah is the first one who hasn't been kind of disqualified for one reason or another to have a position of leadership. Uh, but further than that, there's actually some more stuff to look at regarding Judah. Uh, some things he did that might have particularly qualified him for a position of prominence. Now, of course, we all probably know that Joseph was sold into slavery by his family, but uh, if you recall the story correctly, the initial plan was actually to kill off Joseph. And uh, Judah was actually the one who intervened and said, oh, no, 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 let's not, let's not kill him off. Let's, let's sell him into slavery. Uh, specifically, this is in Genesis 37 through 26. 
Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. So, being sold into slavery is still really, really horrible, but this could be interpreted as an act of mercy by Judah. Now, it might be a selfish thing. Maybe he's just trying to be like, eh, murdering seems a bit much. But it could also be him trying to curb the bloodlust of his brothers. Uh, it, it's hard to say. Certainly still being wicked, but maybe less wicked. And he seems to have the ability to kind of shape his brethren to a certain extent. So we can see those leadership qualities even early on. Uh, the next major thing is uh, the story with Tamar, which uh, in that story, I, I actually didn't review it carefully myself, and I think I get remember the gist of it. But regardless, he did some bad stuff with Tamar, um, and you might think, well, that's a bad thing. That's, that's disqualifying. It should take him out of position of leadership, and maybe. But also he actually genuinely repented of it. Uh, he, he seemed to be very upset with himself when he realized what he had done, when he had really confronted with his own sin, and, and he turned away from it. And that's something many people don't do, and that's a very important thing if you're going to, to well, even be a, an actual believer, is to, to repent of your own doing. And perhaps most importantly, by the time we get to, uh, of course, the story of, of Joseph, he ends up going to slavery, he eventually becomes uh, second in all of of Egypt, uh, the right-hand man of the Pharaoh, and he has that encounter with his brothers where the brothers come to Egypt looking for for help because they're they're doing poorly. Children of Israel need to take Benjamin with them. Judah is the one that specifically takes responsibility for Benjamin because of course Israel really didn't want to lose Benjamin. It was kind of his favorite son in place of Joseph. And Judah's like, okay, I'll I'll vouch for him. I will take care of him. And when Benjamin was framed uh, for for committing a crime, Judah was the one who was like, no, 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 take me. Don't, don't, no, 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 don't, don't take him. We really need him. It'll break our father's heart. Uh, Benjamin doesn't need that. You know, he tried to inter intervene for the sake of his brother. So Judah, this whole way, seems to be manifesting relatively good qualities, and certainly he's in a leadership position. And this seems to be something that Israel also saw in Judah, because if we go to Genesis 49, which is the section where Israel is doing the blessing to his various sons, he says, Judah, your brother shall praise you, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouches as a lion. And as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. Old Jewish poetry, it's kind of its own thing, isn't it? I just thought that was kind of interesting. I never paid attention to qualities that may have put Judah in a position of prominence. And of course, in case you don't know, uh, Judah was the tribe that had David, um, the greatest king of Israel. So that's a pretty big deal, quite the honor. When the civil war happened in Israel, 10 tribes went one direction uh, into the northern kingdom, and two tribes, uh, Judah and Benjamin, if I'm recalling correctly, which again, it's interesting, those two are paired up again. Judah and Benjamin are the two that take the southern kingdom and, and stick more closely to God, though didn't last super long, but they stuck more closely to God. And the, the other tribes ended up getting scattered. Uh, and Judah, as the leading tribe of the two remaining tribes, uh, became even more predominant. And that's how the children of Israel became known as the Jews, Jews for Judah. Um, so the, the whole concept of the Jewish people is a reference to Judah's position of leadership. And of course, the ultimate thing is that Jesus himself came from the line of Judah. So hmm, I just thought that was kind of neat. So yeah, this is actually probably going to pair really, really well with our next video because the next video is going to be... There, there are some issues in this particular passage. And uh, you're probably thinking, you either know what I'm talking about or you're like, what in the world are you talking about? There's not that much to talk about in this passage. 
but there's some particular issues in this passage which are actually really complicated and um, at first it was kind of confusing and tough for me but I decided to, to dig in more deeply before I, I tried to talk about them and after spending a lot of time really digging into it and and really doing my best to understand I've come up with a, a deeper stronger more powerful level of confusion and and pain in my head uh, so they're really complicated issues, uh, and I hope to to next week be able to pass on that headache to you. Uh, but yeah, so it should be pretty interesting. I don't really have anything to say particularly about this passage other than what I've already said, so I think that's where we're going to wrap up. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next time.